And hello and welcome to the Slam Jam Wrestling Podcast. I am your host, David Pstansky, and welcome, welcome, one and all. The Slam Jam Wrestling Podcast, one of the new and improved podcasts here from Extremed.tv. So head over to youtube.com forward slash Extreme Improv and smash that subscribe and head over to our new website www.extreme.tv for all the latest articles, podcasts and shows including our new comedy panel show themed all about wrestling which is the Slam Jam Wrestling Show. But for now, on today's podcast, we are going to be deep diving in with a review of the NWA's return to, well, turn, return to anything, really, because it has been a year since the NWA stopped doing anything in light of the pandemic, and now they are back for the attack. So this was only announced about 10 days ago, maybe two weeks ago, that NWA would be coming back. And they put on a two-hour pay-per-view, which was available on Fight TV. And let's just give a rundown of what was on the card, and then we'll go over the results and go over what uh, the thoughts were on each of the matches. Uh, But let's see how many matches we had. We had one, two, three, four... Five, six matches, only six. I thought there was at least one more than that. But we had Sliced Boogie against uh, Crimson, Clearwater, and Jack Stain. We had Kratos against Tyrus. We had NWA television champion The Pope against uh, Thomas Latimer. We had the number one contenders match for the NWA World Women's Championship Thunder Rosa against Camille. We had the NWA National Championship with champion Trevor Murdoch um, defending against Chris Adonis, formerly known as Chris Masters. And we had the NWA World's Heavyweight Champion Nick Aldis defending against Aaron Stevens. So, this was, it was a good show is what I can say to begin with. It felt, it felt good just to see the NWA back. It's, it's always been the thing throughout lockdown and everything that it felt a real shame that the NWA wasn't able to continue and there's all kinds of reasons they had obviously uh, a fair amount of controversies they had people who left NWA and went to AEW or maybe even one or two that went to the WWE so there were things along the way which probably prevented them coming back sooner than what they have but it always felt a shame just because when you'd seen episodes of NWA Power how they only had audience on one side uh, it felt like well if any show is going to continue without an audience there this is the one where we're used to watching three sides of the wrestling without there being an audience there Mm. so with this being back one of the things I did notice and we'll get on to all of the matches and results soon, was that we could hear an audience, but I don't think they ever actually showed the audience. So I should imagine that there was very limited audience. They, it was probably uh, friends and family of the wrestlers, uh, production crew and other wrestlers creating the atmosphere of the of like the audience sound. But we, I don't think we ever actually saw the audience, which we did during the episodes of NWA Power. Um, so it it was just interesting in that regard, just because why couldn't have they done this a year ago, six months ago, whatever the reasoning. One of the big things now, though, is that when NWA Power does return next week, uh, it will be on Fight TV, and I think it's basically $5 a month to get three episodes, plus you can watch all of the archive, archive episodes. I will be doing this at least for the first month, I just hope that... The uh, the wrestling they put on is good. One of the great things about NWA is it has this very nostalgic, old-school feel. And it's, I don't know, it's something comforting about watching it. So, let's go over the matches. The Well, the pay-per-view itself. One of the things I also noticed, when the show started, you could hear the theme music... And I, was, and I thought they'd announce that it would be Into the Fire, but I think that's going to be for power, and then this had a different theme. And the uh, commentary at the top of the show, I forget the name actually of the uh, main play-by-play commentator, 
but we also had Tim Storm, which is replacing, obviously, uh, Thingy What's It, that's now in WWE, gosh, what's his name, Wade Barrett, God, I was trying to remember his like actual name that he used in NWA, but it slipped my mind, who replaced uh, Jim Cornette, so they've had like a revolving door on these commentators, who knows if Tim Storm will be staying there in the commentary booth, maybe he will, maybe and now, like another year later, he's might be thinking of actually retiring permanently. But I'm sure we'll see him with the right storyline get back in the ring, because I think he's going to be very, very loyal to the NWA. And, yeah, we couldn't quite hear the commentary over the beginning there, so there was a couple of, like, tech issues. Uh, we started the show with a video of Aaron Stevens, obviously talking about the fact that we had lost... Uh, the question mark just two or three weeks ago. So it's it's amazing just to think what this may have been like if if obviously question mark hadn't passed away because that was only what would have that been three weeks ago. I'll try and get the date on that. And yeah, if that was three weeks ago that um, he passed away, they were obviously planning this and about to announce it. That Joseph Hudson, when did he pass away? 25th of February, so just under a month ago. And then obviously this show was kind of shaped around the main event being uh, Aaron Stevens. Because obviously Aaron Stevens came out with the question mark. He was learning his uh, Mongrovian karate, karate and all this other business uh, from him. So in terms of storyline, this was the right main event to go for. And obviously Damien Sandow, he he feels like he'd fallen out of the limelight after WWE, basically after he'd reached the height of the Damien Mizdow days. And now being in NWA a year ago, well, I'll get into this in a second. There is a, like a, a recurring theme in the NWA, which isn't entirely positive, but there is a strong upside to having people that perhaps fallen a little bit out of the spotlight and it's like they you know they found their place and it's not necessarily that it's a bad place but it's it's noticeable that that's several of their talents but okay the first match we had slice boogie and he defeated clearwater crimson and jack stain now other than crimson i didn't know any of these guys i'll be completely honest and slice boogie winning he <sighs> Yeah, he hit a kind of weak-looking pile driver at the end, uh, which was a shame. He teased it earlier in the match. Um, Clearwater, he literally, he looked apparently he's wrestled in uh, New Japan, but to me he looked really nervous when he first came out. Crimson, I haven't seen maybe three, four years since I can remember seeing him in TNA or something. Uh, so it was good to see him back there. But it, it was a good match. One of the big things I noticed, though, on this pay-per-view, and because obviously this pay-per-view happened the same night as WWE Fastlane, and just watching one to the other, obviously this goes for the retro aesthetic, but one thing I think they could take a cue from from WWE is just a little bit of their camera work, because there were punches that just looked like they weren't hitting hard, they weren't laying them in. And watching WWE, it might just be that some of the NWA guys haven't wrestled as much over the last year, if at all. Some of them are still working off ring rust and they've got to do it coming back for a pay-per-view. But some of some of it just felt like it wasn't as hard-hitting. felt a little bit like it was like they knew what to do, but it was like riding a bike and it's still coming back to them. And yeah, when you watch WWE, I especially you know, tiny spoilers, uh, Daniel Bryan clips the referee, and the referee bumps like Dolph Ziggler, it was incredible. But it just felt like a little bit that some of the punches and things in in NWA were landing a little bit soft. We did have, uh, next, a short match, Kratos and Tyrus. And, yeah, what can I say? Like, Tyrus came out, I think this is his NWA debut, He's had a wave of controversy over him for a few years. Um, and it's interesting that NWA brought him in just because, obviously, I think Dave Lagana had controversy 
which was following Jim Cornette having controversy. And so I'd have thought they would have shied away from this. But if he's, I don't know the ins and outs of it, but if he, if he's not convicted of anything or depending what it was, if if they've brought him in, I, I don't know the details on it. But I know there was, when I saw that he was announced Tyrus on the on Twitter, that there was loads of people complaining about it. But he came in and he'd got... The interesting thing about Tyrus coming in is he'd got the attitude which it looked like WWE were going to bring Brodus Clay in with when they first brought him in and then they swerved us and brought him in with the Ernest Miller theme and like he was the hip-hop dinosaur or whatever he was, the brontosaurus, I can't remember. But, you know, so they brought him in, he cut his own promo here and then it was a short match and it was quite good that it was a short match but like Tyrus and like Crimson it doesn't feel so fair because he obviously he's not ex-WWE he's ex-TNA but it just feels like people that I haven't seen in a while seem to land in uh, NWA Um, next up though we've got the Pope which is another example and the Pope I remember like a year ago that it seemed like he was a good get of someone that... Oh, okay, so he's, it's been a while since he was in TNA. It's been a while, obviously, even longer since he was in WWE. But he could still go. But... I just felt that he was missing a step. I don't know. And he had he had a good match uh, with Tom Latimer. But it was a NWA TV Championship match. And they've got this rule so that if there's uh, a... NWA power show it'll be like six minutes and five seconds time limit for it because of this whole 605 time when they start but with this it was 10 minutes and five and it went to a time limit draw so we potentially get another match with these guys later on I think a lot of this show was just saying hey we're back and setting up a couple of potential storylines but it it wasn't trying to wrap up any storylines because why have any title changes on this pay-per-view unless they think that they're not going to have someone in the future just because you know it would it would just be that oh we didn't even remember that the pope was the tv champion or we don't remember that um trevor murdoch is the nwa national champion or, or whatever so having just all of the titles kind of stay where they are allows just to remind people that, okay, so when we're back with power next week, this is the lay of the land. So this, I'm not saying this was a bit of a um, stagnant pay-per-view, but in terms of the results, they played everything fairly safe. Now, the only one that was a surprising, and I have a slight conspiracy theory over it, was that Camille defeated Thunder Rosa. Um, for the number one contenders match for the NWA World Women's Championship. And it was a good match. Thunder Rosa, everything she does basically is good. I've perhaps seen one match of hers in AEW, which was a little bit underwhelming when she first got there. But genuinely, um, generally rather, she she does very, very good matches. She main evented uh, the other day on Dynamite. And it was interesting just because... They they said about that she's just had a brutal match or a bloody match or whatever on the commentary, but they didn't say main eventing Dynamite for AEW, which would have felt like a positive rub to, rub to give her. That, combined with the fact that Camille wins, uh, Camille won rather, it makes me think that either that they're saying, OK, so Thunder Rose has been in AEW and she just won, and she isn't even our best. Camille's our best. Because that would be a way of saying, yeah, well, if Thunder Rosa can main event the first women's main event match in AEW on Dynamite and win, but we have someone that's even better than her, then it means that Camille is therefore better than anyone else in AEW as well, and the two top women between both companies are both in NWA. Either that, or it means that Thunder Rosa is going to AEW more permanently and will not be staying, because, once again, Thunder Rosa had a main event, the first women's main event in AEW uh, Dynamite history, and 
then she loses here. Is this her exit? Is this a case of, well, look, I'd better wrap up my business. I'm associated with the NWA. NWA have been good and let me go to AEW to wrestle during the pandemic. But, you know, now it's back. I'm not going to completely just disappear on them. Uh, but I'm going to start to either wind it down or this will be my swan song. I don't know. Either way, uh, Camille, you know, won convincingly. Camille, you know, she she looks very convincing. She she you know she's really quite built, considering that she doesn't instantly give that look when she comes out, like what came out before with Nick Aldis and all this. But yeah, she uh, absolutely like Thunder Rosa is like absolutely dynamite, but she's deceptively small. So Camille did dominate over in that sense as well. Then we had the NWA National Championship, uh, Trevor Murdoch and Chris Adonis, which is Chris Masters. And this is just a match from 15 years ago, and it feels so weird to say this, that 15 years ago, and both of these guys still kind of stuck in that time bubble, I'm pleased genuinely for both of them, especially for Trevor Murdoch, just because I remember the the vignettes on Power where I think he was just like indicating that, oh, he thought he was done in the wrestling industry and the NWA is coming along and I remember the emotion when he won the national championship. But just pairing these two together, it did just feel like, gosh, you know, it feels like what happened to you guys in between when we saw you in WWE and now you're here. Now, obviously, uh, Chris Masters has popped up I th- think in either TNA or, or somewhere. I'm sure he's been somewhere along the way. But, you know, he was just, you know, the fact that he's still going for the master lock, he, he hasn't he hasn't evolved really at all. And, like, in terms of his character, the fact that, like, even at the end of this, this ended with Trevor Murdoch not breaking the master lock but slipping out of it into a roll-up before um, the master lock could be put on. It was an interesting choice, but anyway, so Murdoch retained. Afterwards, uh, Chris Masters attacked Murdoch, and so that might be setting up something more, because one thing to remember is, in seeing that Chris Adonis is there, in seeing that Tyrus is there, and perhaps a couple of these other guys... Uh, Slice Boogie, Clearwater, Crimson, all these NWA have had to do a sense of rebuilding. Like like I said, this is a two-hour pay-per-view, six matches only, and like th- their their roster is super thin at the moment. It will it will thicken up, no doubt. And I should imagine now that they're going to fight TV, they're playing a little bit of wait and see before they you know hire too many people. Just because if it doesn't work out and then they feel like, well, we need to go back to YouTube. I think they've said that being on YouTube wasn't making them the money that doing 20-odd episodes of Power was always losing money. um, Is what I seem to remember. Or maybe it was breaking even. But it's not not the cheapest um, show to produce just to put onto YouTube. Although that said, obviously AEW put... Uh, dark and now dark um, elevation onto YouTube, and so there must there must be some sense to doing this as a method. But anyway, we then came to the NWA World Heavyweights Championship match. Uh, we saw a Nick Aldis promo earlier in the show, and everyone was very very respectful for the question mark who like passed away a month ago. Everyone spoke about Joseph Hudson, his family, his son, Aaron Stevens' cut promo where it sounded like he was um, tearing up a little bit before he could get through it, or even before he could even begin, saying about, you know, uh, his son and, you know, he'd be, like, looking down on him and and, and what have you. Um, but... Damien Sandow, Aaron Stevens, Damien Mizdow, what a waste by WWE. And I've not been a fan of the gimmicks they gave him in NWA where he came in and says, oh, I'm a Hollywood actor. It felt like 
well, we know that's not who you are. We know you're Damien Sandell. And just coming out there claiming with these fake, these really bad fake trailers didn't work for me. Pairing him up with a question mark worked really well because it almost gave a similar similar vibe to when he was paired up with The Miz as his stunt double, where he's just like, oh, I'm going to get involved with some someone. Like, he, he got involved with The Miz and was his stunt double, and it's like, he'll, he'd happily do that. So he'd happily get involved with uh, the question mark. So obviously now he's a one-half the World Tag Team Champions, but for this, he was going for the World Championship. He he wasn't successful. And and it was a good match. Nick Aldis, uh, Nick Aldis has been a solid champion for the NWA for three-odd years now. And I think they said about he's been World Champion for something like 800 days. Now, I think that's in this run. Because obviously, for about a month or two months, he'd lost it to Cody Rhodes at all out but he was world champion for the better part of a year before that I think and he he seemed like like they even played the promo where he said about like oh he's not having to get back into shape or he's not having to get back ready he is ready and and he looked it um there was a great like you know he he delivered a great like flying elbow off the top and you know, he he was it was just a solid old school style wrestling match, and a lot of these were like I mentioned earlier. Some of the, like the camera work could emphasise the action a little bit more, but overall, this was a solid old school style. Like for me, this feels like watching WCW on a Saturday afternoon, watching like as if I was watching. I don't know Super Brawl two, or if I was watching an old NW like an old NWA tape, just something where it's just got this old flavor, like the the wrestling moves. It wasn't all spots, it wasn't all flips. There was lots of mat wrestling. There was like you know big guys who were slightly out of shape, like you know Trevor Murdoch, you know, and it's like obviously Kratos, Tyrus. Um, who else did we have? Was it? Um, Jack Stain, I think I forget even who who was who in that match, but like some bigger guys, and just like slugging it out with each other, and and it's convincing. It looks like these are actual wrestlers who feel like they're matched up. Nick Aldis just looks like he's a tough guy, and he's got this gravitas where you feel like he can out wrestle you, he will outpower you, and that he's like a a good well-rounded performer so at the end of it obviously this was in honor of the question mark and they had people come out and i assume uh it was his wife of the question mark of uh joseph hudson to hold up the the question mark flag like it was a shame that it seemed like they went off the air but then you know they may have momentarily momentarily come back on the air but that again audio issues Aaron Stevens was giving some speech which I don't know if they're airing it somewhere else but it got lost a little bit but I, I would say this was a a good show overall it was it's certainly a show which like for example if you watch Fast Lane and I'll have my review of Fast Lane up tomorrow on this podcast so do check that out but if you watch Fast Lane there's some good matches on there but some of what you get just feels like it's just okay this is just filler or this is just a match on the card and especially when you get the whole fiend and alexa bliss and randy orton stuff later on i don't think people are going to want to watch that but i think you could put on this nwa show like any any time and you didn't need tons of stories going in because there weren't they didn't even have build time to have tons of stories going in but it just meant that it was a a solid wrestling card with like good matches well like, like decent good matches there was there wasn't a single bad match on here the highlight matches obviously um probably the best match was camille thunderosa um nick oldis aaron stevens definitely up there uh pope tom latimer good as well like i said i felt like Pope, I felt, was just seemed a little bit slower in his step than what I've seen him in the past. 
Uh, the opener, though, Clearwater, Crimson, uh, Dane and Slice Boogie, that that was a good match as well. You know, there was a couple of, li- you know, less memorable ones. Trevor Murdoch, Chris Adonis. It was, it was all right for what I could expect from them, especially, you know, a few years down the line. In one sense, though, they actually seemed like they were more experienced and just the the match felt like it meant more to them at this stage of their career. Tyrus Kratos, it was just, I suppose, what people call the Hoss fight. And, yeah, that was probably the the uh, least memorable. It was a very short match on the on the card, but just probably the, the filler of the card. But, like, the ones that people remember from this, obviously, Aldis and Stevens and Camille and Thunder Rosa... And it's such a shame when you look at, obviously, where NWA has come from a year ago when they had, obviously, Ricky Starks, they had um, Eddie Kingston. Like, I don't know, even when they had, like, the Rock and Roll Express, they always, gosh, who did they have on this as well? I'm trying to think. Um, They had one or two other people make an appearance. I even forget off the top of my head now. Uh, Who was it? I can't remember. Uh, so anyway, it was it was a good show. I, I would give this a okay. So out of ten, I would give this a solid high seven out of ten. It was it doesn't deserve less than that. It perhaps hasn't earned more than that. Out of five, I'd give it a solid three out of five, which is a good review. This isn't a four out of five, unfortunately. Um, hopefully they'll get their roster back in order fairly soon. You know, just get a few people in there. Like, obviously, if Thunder Rosa has been in AEW, then hopefully they'll get James Storm back. You know, hopefully they'll get a few other people on their roster. Let's take a quick look over at their roster page just to see if we can see who they've got. Going to that now, it says we're back. And let's see. Shows, power. Oh, it sees Shockwave and all these things. I didn't even see a lot of this stuff. But no, I don't think they've got... They don't have a roster page, perhaps because they knew their roster was such in flux at the moment. But anyway, that was NWA Power. and No, it wasn't. It was NWA Back for the Attack. And we'll have Power coming up again this week. So that's going to be very exciting. 6.05 on Tuesday on Fight TV. I will certainly be covering it a lot more in the future. I like covering NWA. I like covering... Some of these, like, lesser covered promotions. And with that, um, I will say that's all from me. Make sure you hit that subscribe button over on youtube.com forward slash extreme improv and smash that um, like button and that bell icon. That would really help a lot. And obviously go over to extremes.tv, which is X-S-T-R. E-A-M-E-D, so like the word streamed, like you're live streaming with an X at the front, so xstreamed.tv, and you'll be able to find loads of articles on wrestling, on NWA, WWE, AEW, Impact, uh, New Japan, covering all sorts of stuff there, so do check that out. Uh, There'll be another podcast that I'll have up tomorrow, looking at Fastlane and Raw, and so from me, until next time, my name is David Stansky. And have a good one. Always stay extreme. Oh, and don't miss the Slam Jam Wrestling Comedy Panel Show, which will be on Thursday night at 7pm. And until then, bye for now. <laughs>